Thanks, Daniel. All right, so we have Patty Ragsdell, uh, the founder of Botanical Belonging at Happy Apple Farms, where through propagation, cultivation, and sale of native plants, our community has access to firsthand information about the native plants of our region. Along with her husband, Brent, she has operated Happy Apples Farm Native Plant Nursery at their home in Tonganoxie since 2016. She is a K-State Extension Master Naturalist, volunteering time at the Pollinator Prairie in Olathe, and serves on the board of directors for the Kansas Native Plant Society. She has an endearing passion for learning about the native plants around her. Inspired by her college studies of plant taxonomy and ecology, she has included native plants in her gardens for nearly 30 years. This is landscaping or designing. I'm not sure. I have two different versions, Patty, with, um, written down with native plants. Um, it, it will be about exploring the world of native plants and their application in home landscape design. So take it away, Patty. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here to talk with you guys. Can you hear me okay? Great. Um, as Emily says, uh, we um, have just recently, this year is the first year, uh, turned Happy Apples Farm into a nonprofit that is really focused on um, hands-on native plant education. And people um, just this year have started helping me here um, and really, I just talk the whole time about plants and any questions they have. We, we talk about weeding gardens and how I do that, and they help me. Um, we haven't quite gotten to the plant propagation part because we were well into our season when that started. Um, but we do uh, share seedlings, which is a really fun way to um, kind of learn about how you, once you get started with these plants, as long as you learn to identify these seedlings and the plants as they come up, um, you will have an abundance of plants um, yourself and really the need to buy plants <laughs> kind of goes away, especially as more of us start to plant those. Um, okay, so I think what I'll start with now is um, sharing my screen. And again, I just want to say thanks for, for allowing me to talk with you guys today. I'm pretty excited, as always, to talk about native plants. So let me see if I can get my sheet screen going. Oh, I have several of these up. There we go. Um, all right, you're probably looking at it now and I don't have my control going. There we go. The participants thing is in my way. All right. Okay, are you seeing anything? It says that it's shared. We're seeing your screen. It's not in presentation mode though, just so you know, but we are seeing it. Okay. Sharing is paused. Bring your shared window to the front. wonder why that is. Did that change anything? No? We're seeing your screen. Um, you just won't be able to see us or yourself while you present yeah. if, once you put it in presentation mode. I am seeing you guys, which is interesting. Let's see. Hmm. I wonder how I did that. Well, do you, can you see enough of the screen? I mean, enough of the video? Let me see here. Chord reactions. I'm looking here to see if I can um, make this full screen. If you hit, did you hit play or did, can yeah. you hit view? In my keynote view, enter full screen. There we go. Nice. Is that better? Perfect. Okay. Good. Awesome. So a little bit of the, um, I'm gonna close this actually. I'm trying to um, um, get it to where I can see something on the side here. 
without blocking my presentation. Okay, I think I got it. Um, all right, well, sorry for all of that, but um, again, I'm Patty Ragsdale, founder of Botanical Belonging and um, owner of uh, Happy Apples Farm Native Plant Nursery. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about landscaping with native plants, but uh, really it's when you're landscaping, it's about designing. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of go through some of my favorite plants that I use for that and just talk about some of the things that um, I consider when I'm designing a garden. Um, and maybe at the end, if we have time, uh, we can chat a little bit if you have questions about how I manage some of these gardens, because that's a that's really become a big a big deal for a lot of people. Um, the pictures here are of a garden that I planted. Um, I think I started it in 2009. This picture was taken in 2012. Um, if you saw what it started as, you would never have thought it would ever get pretty, uh, but it did. It was pretty fun. Um, and lucky me, I got to start on, you know, bare dirt which is what I did here when we moved here also. So uh, this was my home over in Missouri um, on at a place called Lake Tapawingo. And um, let me think, this only got about three hours of sun kind of, but it was in the middle of the day. So uh, kind of thinking about that, you'll, you'll see a, a juxtaposition of this kind of garden with the garden that I work with now. So let's see if we can't advance this. There we go. Um, as as we've said, I'm a uh, I've started Happy Apples Farm, my husband and I, in 2016 here. But prior to that, I was a graphic designer. I worked at Hallmark. I got to retire early in 2015 to focus on what we're doing here. Um, but strangely, I studied wildlife management in college. Um, but I also had a uh, an associate's degree in um, advertising design and was always an artist, um, really, really um, wanted to study the, the things that I thought were beautiful in the world and became really good at illustrating. And that's how I ended up in graphic design through that illustration mode. And I always have been an avid gardener um, and became that botanist part, like just really interested in, in all the plants I saw around me and identifying them um, after I took plant taxonomy when I was studying wildlife management. Um, botanical belonging uh, just started this year, as I said, and I'm really excited to be able to share, you know, this exploration of all these plants around me and help people really get comfortable with the plants in our world. Um, and what we're seeing when we drive down the road or what we're seeing when we take a walk through the woods. Is it a native plant? Is it an invasive plant? Um, those things uh, really kind of help me to feel familiar with my environment and, and really trust my own sense of, of um, what is good and bad around me and what I find beautiful and maybe not so pretty even though it might be pretty. So some of these, some of the invasive species we see around us are super pretty. And that's why they're here because we brought them here because they're pretty. Anyway, this plant here is one that you don't see very often. Um, it's got a couple of names. Uh, wood betony is probably the most common name and I am not as enough familiar with it to say the Latin name out loud. I, <laughs> I recognize it when I see it though. So why do we landscape? And I'd say the first reason is for comfort. Um, this is a picture of me a long time ago when we bought this property in a field of brome, um, which I didn't even know was brome then. Brome is a non-native uh, uh, grass that was brought here for pastures and hay. Um, it's great for horses. Uh, so a lot of people want something like you're seeing here, which is just a real solid field of brome. But you can see it's up to my armpits. That's not very comfortable to walk through. And I was always afraid, you know, what am I stepping on? Because I can't even see my feet. So we are way more comfortable with what we see in the bottom picture, which is a, a mowed lawn. I mean, we can walk very, you know, comfortably and, and see our home, see our feet, see, see, you know, make sure we're not stepping in holes or on animals. Um, so comfort, I think, is the first reason why we landscape. Uh, and this is kind of to show you how simple it is to landscape. Um, the picture on the left is uh, 
Wayne Rodas is a, a friend of mine. He lives down the street. He's a wonderful bird photographer, but he also was one of the first people I knew in a in a subdivision setting. He's not very far from me, but it's still a subdivision that um, grew uh, just a plot of native plants in his backyard. But it was solid native plants. In, in, the, in the summer, you'd have 10 foot tall Maximilian sunflower, you know, standing up there. You could not walk through it. Um, but landscaping something like this, which is a wonderful habitat for animals and insects, um, is as simple as providing a path. The picture on the, on the right is the um, Kanza Prairie Nature Trail, which is just an awesome place to go and walk, uh, wide open, you know, but along the trail there, you see a lot of a lot of native plants that you can identify and it's super pretty, as simple as a trail. And that trail doesn't even need to be maintained because the soil is so thin there. Um, the gentleman that was working on it the day I visited said, no, we don't do anything to the trail. It's just people walking that keeps it clean. Um, another reason we landscape is for beauty. This is a picture of a garden in um, uh, British Columbia uh, that we visited um, a few years ago, I think about 2017. Bouchard Gardens, I think is how you say it. Uh, and it is pretty much plants as decoration. So uh, they are probably not one of those in there as a native plant, but uh, really beauty here is, is the focus. Um, just incorporating, you know, very neat and tidy uh, places that people can just observe how pretty plants are. A third reason is a nature connection. I think a lot of us really want to get out into nature and be with nature, but be comfortable. Um, this is a picture that we took in that um, same trip that we took out to the Pacific Northwest, uh, and they've just provided a, a, a boardwalk, you know, through the woods, which really allows you to get in there and real and not trample, you know, the the vegetation underneath you. Um, really, a wonderful way to get connected um, to a natural space. I think why natives. Uh, what I think first attracted me was that they're pretty. Um, I, I mean, I would just find these things outside and I'd think, wow, what is this? This is gorgeous. Why isn't this in a garden? And that's what got me started with putting these in my gardens. And why not? I mean, look at all the variety of color and, and shape and, and um, texture that you have when you kind of try to focus yourself on this one thing and exploring this option for gardens. These are just a few. Another thing is they attract wildlife. They are necessary for some of our beautiful butterflies and insects, um, host plants like this uh, swamp milkweed, which is the pink flower in the foreground here. Um, you can see a caterpillar on it. And then there on the right, you can see the mature butterfly nectaring on that same plant. So some of these plants um, are needed mostly for nectar, but others are host plants for the caterpillars um, and are required by some species uh, to have them survive. So I think of a zebra swallowtail, the only um, plant that uh, it can raise its young on is a pawpaw. So without pawpaws, we don't have zebra swallowtails. And yet the zebra swallowtail can nectar on a lot of species the adult. Um, this is another, I don't know if you guys can see this running, but this was one of my first uh, experiences with understanding some of the things that might happen in, in these gardens when I'm just working all day. This is one of our clear wing moth species. I can't remember which one. It's not the snowberry clear wing moth, but I see snowberry clear wing moths a lot, but they're really kind of cool. And this was just on Rose Verbena. So I was sitting on the ground weeding and this happened right next to my elbow. Another reason um, is the, the, the sense that they belong here. Um, it, it sometimes makes it very easy to incorporate these into your gardens. Um, this particular plant grows in my pasture a lot. It's spider milkweed, Asclepias viridis. And I think it's gorgeous and have tried years and years and years to get it in my garden from a transplant. I can grow it in the pots, it's fine, but as soon as I transplant it in the garden, it shrivels up and goes away. Um, 
but I finally did uh, in the last couple of years get one to grow. I've got two actually growing in my garden and one actually bloomed this year. So a lot of persistence, a lot of patience, and I finally got it to happen. I love these things. And then they're unique. I mean, they not very many people have seen something like this in their garden. This is actually an annual um, called Leavenworth Oringo or Oringium Leavenworthii. And uh, it starts out green like every other plant, very spiky, thistle-like look. And then the whole plant just turns purple in September, about the 1st of September, sometimes late August. And then I always put this in here because, you know, when you when you start to really explore native plants, you start to get used to those Latin names and really kind of realize how important they are because um, common names can be different for the same plant or uh, can refer to two different plants with the same common name. Um, so some of that gets to be a little confusing for people. So when you start to learn things like uh, the, the Latin names, you can say, this is Oenothera macrocarpa. It's very drought tolerant and its flowers open in the evening so it can be pollinated by moths. So there's lots of ways to feel like you're really learning something and, and have something um, special uh, that can uh, help the people around you learn about the native plants in our environment. So what is a native plant? That's a big question, and it's one I'd invite everybody to uh, think about um, because uh, I, I picked these uh, four photos to kind of discuss this uh, kind of um, thought process because some of these here are cultivars. Some of these are native to the US. Some of them are grow out in my pasture, and some of them were brought with Europeans when we settled here in the um, in North America. So, uh, you know, some of these are, you know, I have all of these in my garden, all of these around my place, but uh, understanding range and things like that are really important in your decision making when you're including native plants in your garden and the way that you talk about the native plants in your garden. So I, I mentioned range and here are a couple of um, range map uh, websites that I use a lot. I probably use the top one more than the bottom one, boneapp.org. Uh, and we could go there, but I'll wait until later. Maybe we can visit that if we have some questions. And then this usda.gov, which is the plant database, the native plant data or the plant database. It's not just native. So um, history, like uh, that one of the pictures uh, in the previous slide, showed a plant that grows just wild all around here and it's pretty awesome um, but it's called uh, self heal or prunella vulgaris and it was brought with settlers um, sometimes i hear people saying there's a native variety or something of it and there may be um, but i'm not sure but the history around that is is a really interesting thing to explore when you're thinking about it habitat um, if I take a wetland plant and I grow it in a drier setting, am I, is it still native there? I think it is, but you know, there are lots of ways to kind of think about what's native where, and you'll hear these things discussed um, a lot of times on the group page uh, for the Kansas Native Plant Society for IDing plants. And what is a garden? Let's talk about that. I think a garden is a place for people. So as we said, just as something as simple as a path can make change something, it can landscape something and make it more for people, make it comfortable. But that's what I think of gardens as. Um, one thing is for sure, it's a place that people would use, even though they might be a pollinator garden. That's, a, that's the concept I like is we're sharing that space with others. Because when we do include things like pollinator plants, then these children like have an opportunity to explore what is the bee? Is it just the honeybee that's from Europe or is it something like these two little bees? And you might notice they have, one has yellow pollen and one has white pollen. They've been going to different plants and now they're coated with different colored pollen even though they're both on this, this beautiful purple comb flower. Um, I think of gardens as a collection. 
as I said, I might I might take a wetland plant and put it in a put it in a drier setting um, and use it for something, maybe an edge or whatever, however it works. But in this case, uh, this is just looking off my deck. I liked the being able to still see the bones of this garden at this point. That's almost gone because this was a few years ago. But um, I utilized this uh, this wetland space um, at the end of a downspout um, to make a make a little bit wetter environment that I could uh, look at a collection of plants off my deck. Usually, it's a curated collection too. It's a minimal species mix and a creative endeavor. I discover things all the time. My creative endeavor when I'm when I'm gardening is is really one that I'm having a conversation with the plants, with the weather, with time um, about what what do I find pleasing, what is serving the purpose of my garden. And in this case, I discovered wonderful color combinations, you know, with these plants. It's it's really fun for me. This is um, through the seasons, really the same garden uh, in my front yard. Um, one, um, we, if we start, you know, go clockwise around, we're seeing all the seasons, um, starting with spring, where you see the blue car, which is my son's car out there in a parking area. And then it gets super tall in the middle of the summer. Um, this is the only one that that summer photo, the one that I uh, um, couldn't find one from taken from the porch, although this is more of a view the top right photo that most people would see of my garden. Um, and then fall, which I think just gets gorgeous, even though it's real wooly, uh, but you mow a nice lawn through there and you get lots of contrast. Um, and then winter, winter is something that um, people don't think much about, but there's a lot of texture and things to explore in a winter garden like that. This is after an ice storm, so it was quite pretty. So how do we go about doing that? Um, site and conditions, those site conditions are, are the, really the, the, the way to begin um, besides putting those bones of the path and things like that in. But um, once you get a path for walking, then what kind of conditions do you have? And so the top garden, which is that old garden that I had over in Missouri, um, that was kind of part shade. Uh, some of parts of it were shadier than others, but a lot of those plants that I've incorporated there are really kind of full sun plants. But because um, I have a, uh, you know, had enough sun in the middle of the day, they would get that kind of hot uh, sun and be able to really thrive in this these conditions. Whereas this bottom is my current garden, which is full sun, at least on that side of the house, and um, really much, much different garden. Uh, although it has pockets of all kinds of things that might be in the shade of another plant or something like that. So a lot of fun to experiment with different plants in this. Um, and uh, I'm really lucky to get to do that all the time. So these are some other examples of different conditions we might solve with native plants. Um, the top uh, left is the end of the retail space where I created some berms and um, kind of a water catchment space for the irrigation that I have to do of the pots. So there's sprinklers up there under those shade structures and that all runs kind of downhill into the space and gives me all kinds of different habitats. But mostly the great thing about this is that it's unlike that, that other photo that was the top of the hill full sun, this one is full sun, but lots of moisture. So I get to do different stuff. Um, and then just to the left of that photo is a shade garden and exploring textures and how that works together because shade gardens often will only have flowers in the springtime, um, which would mimic a forest, you know, when the forest canopy is, is um, bare and lots of light gets through, that's when you'll see the flowers in those, in those shade gardens or shadier areas. Or maybe it's totally a wet garden, a wetland garden where you can have water lilies and things like that or rushes. Um, and then there are some plants that we want for these places between rocks, you know, how, how will we, what, what can we plant there? This happens to be um, small skull cap. It's super awesome. Uh, I fell in love with this plant a couple of years ago um, and just can't say enough good things about it. It's super awesome. So creating a canvas is a lot of, uh, a lot of what I hear people, well, how do you even start? 
And I, I think that the first thing I would say is starting is, is thinking ahead. First, you've got a path. And then how do you kill off any vegetation that's there? Um, I personally don't like to use herbicides, so I don't. I use, in this case, I used a black tarp. So far to the left here, we're seeing after I've taken the black tarp up and that tarp probably sat there for, I don't know, three, at least three months, maybe six months even. Um, so it's kind of ugly, um, but you don't have to do it that way. There's different ways. It killed all the grass. It did not kill uh, bindweed. So bindweed is a real problem here. And then I cover that with another layer, even after it's like this, even after it's dead, I will cover it with a uh, layer of paper. These are feed sacks because we have some um, alpacas. Uh, so the feed sacks, we use that paper um, to, to cover this and then I, I apply mulch and then I'm ready. So you can also see that I added a rock border on the edge of this, which really cleaned things up. Um, so that's what I use to hold the paper down and then keep the mulch in place. So this is my front yard. So time is a big thing to think about. Way ahead am I thinking about these things. And the first thing I did was put that gravel path in to kind of see where people would walk through this garden. And that kind of dictates everything else. Um, because we want the people to be very comfortable in this place. Um, so this was the bones of the garden that I started in 2015. And this photo below it um, was last fall, it's looking really woolly. It's probably September, so not quite fall in my book, but um, really kind of uh, starting to senesce some of the things in there and starting to move towards that more um, golden fall color lots of time between that though. So this was 2015, and this was 2000, what was last year? 21. So a lot of time. And a lot of things changed from what I first planted. And the other thing I want to express is that style. So I am just like every other gardener. I would love every piece of my garden to be very nicely, you know, organized and structured. But that isn't really practical with as many gardens as I have here. So I lean more towards those cottage garden styles um, or in the, the top photo here, this was just a seeded area and that's all mixed up. There's really no organization to that at all. And uh, was my first kind of experience with the importance of identifying what's coming up in, in those spaces. And it's not easy. It, it's maybe not the easiest way to get a garden started if you, if you are too concerned, you know, about what comes up in these gardens. So the bottom is, this was this spring, and I apologize, I, I had a knee replacement in March, and I did not get my um, uh, path weeded like I normally would like to have it before I took a picture. But um, some beautiful things happened in the garden this spring, and I just loved it. This was in May and a lot of things blooming and really I was enjoying everything, especially the white fringe tree that you can kind of see peeking into the um, right side of the bottom photo. That's, that is just wonderful. It has a very short plume time, but when it's blooming, you're just going, oh my gosh, I need to stand out here more. So um, the one thing to think about with design, uh, I would say is curves. You want, you want a lot of curves and you want to kind of have a sense of where you're going to be viewing this garden. So when I put that path in, that's one thing to, to kind of let me know where is my, where, where are people going to view this garden? Personally, I always view the garden from that front porch and I love that view. So the top photo is the view from the front porch and that was probably 2017 or something like that. Um, when we were just getting started. Uh, so in the in the spring, you know, things are just tiny um, and just starting to come up. And there wasn't a lot of vegetation there to begin with because this garden's only a couple years old at that point. And you can even see the black tarp out there where I'm, I'm uh, starting another garden. So it might have been 2018, I'm not sure. Um, and that that's a huge space now that's uh, mostly mulched and has a 
I don't use landscaping fabric much, but I do use it under mulched areas that I never intend to grow any um, plants in, in. So it makes it real easy for me to get the weeds that seed the top of that and um, kind of maintain those spaces as just weed free mulch spaces where people can work. So viewpoint is is huge and curves establishing, you know, curved areas is very pleasing. Some people are more structured, though. So, you know, you could do straight lines and patterns like that. And those kinds of things show up really nicely as uh, to people's eyes as cultivated you know, very structured things like that tell people that this garden is cared for. Um, personally, though, I really prefer curves, things more organic, organic. And this, like I said, is more of the other people's view. As you're standing at the parking area out front, you'd see something like this looking at my um, front yard. And my, this is probably last year sometime, middle of the summer or early summer. And this was uh, that that uh, dry creek bed, you know, as you're walking up to the front door, people might see something like this looking down through that. And finally, let's talk about some of the plants. So those were the aspects of building this space, you know, that you're going to incorporate uh, the plants that you choose into. And some of the things to consider when you're when you're doing that, that one would be that style is huge. Um, but the viewpoint and the curves, you know, just and the path, where are people standing um, when they look at your garden? Um, but plants, that's probably where people like me, I have the most fun because I'm choosing, I'm trying, I'm experimenting, I'm just having fun uh, putting things in there. And this was not this spring, but the, the spring that this little place where you're walking up to the front yard, um, oh my gosh, it was so pretty. It was full of all kinds of purples and pinks and, and the Hookera Richardsonii. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but that little plant right in there, that is an awesome little plant uh, to, to incorporate into these spaces because it gives that airy kind of um, yellowish color that offsets all those purples and pinks and gives a background to it um, and some structure. And, and the when the sun shines through it in the either the morning or the afternoon, um, it really does add a lot to the gardens. And then my habit is when those start to fall over or, or start to look ugly, I just clip them off, you know, and then I'm left with this beautiful rosette of leaves at the bottom, which is nearly evergreen. It has some, some, uh, some, uh, send, uh, some, what do I want to say? It comes out, it flush comes out flush and green in the spring, um, then kind of senesces a little bit in the summer and gets a new flush for the fall. And then that lasts all winter. So you have some structure there all winter. So learning things about that um, are really very fun. So um, when I'm thinking about all these things, I'm, this is a very diverse mix. I would not try to list all the plants in this area, but uh, you would, having those kinds of things gives you a lot of structure to play with throughout the season. So using the seeds and the blooms and the foliage uh, throughout the season is a really, really good thing to consider. Um, but I would start simple. And this was a very simple planting to begin with. Um, it got more complex over the years as I added things to it. Height is going to be something to consider. And then we'll talk about a few of my favorites that I use. So um, starting with the seeds, blooms, and foliage, um, seeds, people don't think about that, but controlling seeds is a big deal. Um, but also leaving some of these structures for texture through the winter and for um, feeding birds, things like that. Um, this Retibita pinata at the bottom there is a really fun thing to talk to people about because when you break open those seed heads, they are super fragrant. It is really wonderful. It's a great plant. Um, there are some problems with maintaining it uh, that I would, you know, discuss with people later if you're if you're interested. But those seed heads in the winter provide all kinds of entertainment from windows. You know, the little finches break them open, and then what's on the ground they they eat. Um, and then there's that fragrant aspect to it. And then here it's all frosty, which is super awesome. The top one is. Um, it's called stiff goldenrod, it's solidago rigida, but it also goes by, 
oligoneuron rigida, rigidum or something like that. It's got two scientific names that are used. Um, but when it goes to seed, those puffs of white are very, very visible. This is in my pasture. It actually grows natively on my land here. So lots to think about with that. And then these are some um, kind of flower combinations that I like a lot. Uh, this one on the, oh, it, it, I've got a misspelling. So um, Pacara obovada is this yellow flower here. It's a ground cover really kind of for shade, which it can do dry shade really, really well. And then Phlox divericata is the purple. Those two together in the spring, you really can't get much better uh, color combination than that in the spring in a shady area. Um, Rubecchia subtomentosa, which is a tall Rubecchia, uh, gets about maybe about four feet. And then um, ironweed, they're both really kind of, they can be kind of aggressive, self-seeding. They don't spread by rhizomes or anything like that. It's just seed. So, but in garden settings, you know, that are tall and the backs of gardens, that's a really pretty combination. They, they bloom at the same time and really kind of do a really pretty offset of color. Um, and then below that is the uh, Caliroe involucrata, which is the purple poppy mallow and Ceanothus americanus. I spelled that wrong too. Um, the white one is New Jersey tea. There's a second species of New Jersey tea um, that's called uh, Ceanothus herbaceus. And both of those, the range of both of those overlaps here. So you'll see both of them out in the Flint Hills. And I have both here. They bloom a month apart. So the, the Ceanothus americanus is the one that blooms at the same time as the purple poppy mallow. And those are the, that combination is super pretty. Um, but if you wanted a, a May bloom that's white like that, use the herbaceous. Um, Liatris aspera, this is a native uh, blazing star. And I just want to point out to everybody that it has the most beautiful buds in the world. So you would want to have those buds in your garden, of course, because they look like a, a string of pearls or something. Um, really cool contrast, but it's a really late blooming blazing star. And you can see it blooming here, top um, right. Uh, amongst some other things that uh, bloom or start to bud at the same time. Um, the, it's, it's a wonderful, all, all of the blazing star species, both the early blooming um, prairie blazing star called Liatris pycnostachia, and um, this one, the late blooming one, this is late August, early September, I think. Um, those are all good nectar plants for butterflies and bees. They are just covered. Uh, it's a great place to observe butterflies. So, but in this setting, you know, it gets kind of tall and it can flop, even though it's not the tallest of the blazing stars. Um, it can, you know, flop over and I use hoops, you know, on the edges. But in this case, these were straight, standing straight up, doing a wonderful job. They never flopped because they were surrounded by all of this other stuff. And so the stuff here that you see, the yellow, pale yellow is... Um, Solidago nemoralis, I think, start getting started blooming. And then Eupatorium altissimum, which is tall bone set. Um, so thinking, you know, about how those kinds of structures, that's kind of past the beginning, right? You're just kind of trying to think, what do I put inside there to keep things standing up? And what can I tolerate that tallness? You know, how much tallness do I want? And what blooms at the same time? So I really love those kind of exploring all that in these designs. Um, Chelone obliqua is this kind of pink right here. That's a uh, rose turtle head and Conoclinium coelistinum, however you say that. It, that is blue mist flower. And that's the little purple flowers here. Blue mist flowers are really aggressive spreader, really aggressive. And in the right conditions, it can get kind of tall. In more sun, it's a little shorter. In this case, I don't mind because the rose turtle head spreads also. So I wanted something that would kind of help fill that space around that plant and that worked really well. So I have to control the edges in that case. I have to take those rhizomes of both of those plants out along the edge. And then I use some sedges, the little sedge that you can see here with the spiky things. That one is, um, I think I call it gray sedge. 
but it's uh, Carrick's gray eye. And it's kind of a wonderful thing. It starts to senesce late in the season, so it gets kind of a yellowish color, but it's pretty kind of combined with all of those things. Okay, so foliage texture, I would say, is something um, to really keep in mind that this won't be blooming all the time. There are going to be a lot of times when it's just about combining foliage texture. And so these kind, these are some things not blooming, or actually the juncus effusus is blooming there. That's common soft rush or something like that is a common name for it. But the compass plant, which I would highly caution anybody about putting that in a garden because it always flops in a garden. Um, but the you just can't beat that. I mean, isn't that gorgeous? Uh, the pattern that the, the leaves make, it's a really wonderful prairie plant. Um, but like I said, just be cautious about the big stalk, which can get really, really tall, is always going to fall over when it goes to flower. And all the sylphiums are aggressive self-seeders, so be very, very careful with that. Um, Verbena stricta is, a, is really wonderful. It's kind of a pasture weed. You know, people don't like it because the cattle don't eat it and things like that, but it blooms a long time. And um, it has a beautiful foliage when it's coming up. It's furry and the dew sticks to it. And then it has these purple stems, really, really pretty. Um, this is again, Liatris. This is Liatris aspera that we're seeing down here in the bottom. Um, and it has, um, some, some of these are really cool when they really start to bloom, or not bloom, but when they start to grow and start to elongate, that new foliage at the top is always that kind of bright yellow and it really adds a lot of uh, color and texture to a garden. Um, height, we talked a little bit about that, but this I'm gonna show Prairie Doc, which isn't a Kansas native. It actually is native right to the border. I saw some on a Kansas Native Plant Society walk last fall uh, and we kind of, inched over onto the Missouri side because we were in southeastern Kansas and, and we were right at the border. So we went over and saw something on the Missouri side and there were no prairie dock on the Kansas side, but yes, they were right there on the Missouri side. So I don't really know why they don't move over, but we don't find them here in Kansas. But they have uh, leaves that are gorgeous in a garden. Um, they're related to compass plant. They're in the same uh, genus, Silphium. And just like compass plant, they can seed themselves aggressively. And those tall stalks can fall over. You can see the tall stalks in this photo. Um, so considering you know, what, what's going to happen when that falls over is a good thing to think about when you incorporate this. I love it for the leaves. I put it it's right next to a path. I, and, and I know that that's a problem when these, when these flower stalks come up. And sometimes I'll go ahead and cut the first flower stalks down. Um, really to kind of concentrate that effort into those next flower stalks and make the time that I have to worry about that those tall stalks fly, falling over a little bit um, shorter. Um, so leaves can be one foot wide, two feet long. They're gorgeous. I would always recommend this, but always also recommend as soon as those flowers, which are yellow sunflower-like things, and they're top of these naked stalks, big sprays of them, real airy, just gorgeous. There's nothing, nothing not gorgeous about this, except that it's huge and it seeds itself. <laughs> you don't want a forest of them. You really just want a couple. So tall, keep talking about this. By the end of the summer, you'll see pictures of the garden. You saw that one earlier, you know, and, the, and it, it's tall, it's as tall as me. And so this is snow on the mountain. I'd always seen it, euphorbia, marginata or marginata and I would see it from the highway and I'd think oh man that is so pretty I really want that and then I went on a walk and stood next to one and I thought oh that's way bigger than I thought because I would read prairie moon nursery says they're two feet to four feet well this is definitely more than four feet it's a well it's at least four feet right that's a big plant um I've tried to grow it and I do have it come up sometimes and where it is coming up because it's an annual doesn't stay where I put it right it's going to seed itself and come up where it works. Um, so it, it is staying shorter in those kinds of conditions um, where it likes to grow it I see it on the roadside here, but we're actually a little bit east of where I see a lot of it which is out more towards you guys. 
uh, in Lawrence. So the one on the right here is Indian grass. A lot of, and I put it in here just to talk about this concept um, with some of our grasses. A lot of our grasses are warm season grasses, our native grasses. So this, even though it can get super tall, like oh, taller than me, six feet tall, um, it doesn't happen. You don't even see, like you walk in my garden now, you don't see this grass at all. This doesn't happen until August. You know, so you, you're, it's going to shoot these up. It's gorgeous. I would totally say it's pretty and it's not anything you wouldn't want to include in a, a grassland garden, but for kind of the structural kind of things that a lot of people ask me for tall, these, these tall grasses, um, it doesn't work that well because the, the tallness doesn't happen until late, late in the season. And then um, it's used to growing with other grasses. So when it doesn't, when it's in a garden setting, it kind of flops out, uh, but it's beautiful. So don't, don't be shy. It does seed itself everywhere, um, but it's a beautiful plant. And if you had a grassland kind of uh, setting where a design, you know, that's just going to be this grassland, that might work in there but don't use it for a screen because it won't happen <laughs> until very, very late and it won't work. All right, um, these are some of my favorites, just my favorite, and I'm just gonna throw them out there for you uh, to consider um, because these uh, are, are plants that uh, I, I use a lot. Um, so it's after 11, I'm gonna check in with everybody. Tell me how far over um, am I? Cause I can run through these really, quick Does anybody else you're you're good on time uh, it goes till like 11 30 but we can go a little bit later or, or okay. earlier depending on how people are feeling okay well these are just a few so i don't have to talk at length about these and then i'd like to have you know a question and answer with people um, if they have any questions about anything and we can review any of these slides so um okay so uh dahlia purpurea we'll just start here this is um uh purple prairie clover. The reason I put this here is not because it's this, this gigantic, gorgeous plant, you know, that, that you need in your garden, but because a lot of us have children and um, other people in their lives that we want to share this stuff with. And I have found this to be the best plant for sharing bees with kids. Um, the way bees utilize the pollen on these rings of flowers around this plant is is fascinating and and it just looks like a little dance where the the bee runs in a circle around that ring collecting pollen as fast as it can and then it jumps to the next one that's blooming so you get a lot of bee activity right there and it's for little kids really really a good height um and it's not an obtrusive plant you know uh but gives you a little bit of color and just a lot of fun with kids so i and it's pretty i you know you can't can't beat it for pretty, but not outstanding, you know, not, not the kind of thing like below, which would be the, the um, butterfly milkweed. And I've combined it here with Amorpha canescens, which is the uh, uh, lead plant. Um, those two together really are very, very pretty um, color combination just because of the pollen, the, the purple, they offset each other really well. Um, so anyway, those two are some of my favorites also. And then we'll go to this one. If you have pots that you want to fill, this little um, um, plant on the uh, top left here is um, Talinum calicinum or calicinum, um, which I call fame flower, uh, or but some people call it rock pink. It's a beautiful little plant that works really well in pots. In, and you can just leave them. These, these pots are retail pots. Um, they open up in the uh, afternoon like this. So a lot of people aren't here late enough in the day to see this happen, but it is gorgeous. And the, the little tuft of, of the uh, succulent foliage will fill a pot uh, just solid. Um, and then these will be above, you know, waving around in the breeze. It's, it's super pretty. Um, but these pots stay out here for years and keep growing and they're super easy to propagate. Okay, 
So the one top right here, the Baptisia australis, which is um, blue wild indigo, that is an incredible plant for uh, a garden setting. Um, sometimes people tell me that they flop. Uh, I'll tell you that in Kansas, there's a um, um, variety which is called Baptisia australis bar minor, uh, which stays a little more compact. Um, I'm not sure which one my plants are, but the way that they behave in that sun garden that I showed you before is that compact form. They don't blow over or flop or anything like that. Whereas in the part shade area where I have some more of, of those, they are, um, they do kind of blow over. Uh, so I don't know, it might, might be related to where they're planted if they get really wet or you know something like that, that they might be a little bit more floppy. But not only do they have these beautiful blue flowers in the spring, this was May and here, this was this year, but right now they have these bright green inflated seed pods. And by late summer, those things turn black and that's pretty in itself. So, you know, in the fall, when people are here to buy plants, we're rattling those around and, and uh, really having a lot of fun with them. They're very pretty. Um, don't forget shrubs. So bottom right here is the button bush. So you'll hear people talk about that. It's really kind of an interesting thing. I had a hard time with it at first because I didn't think about needing to maintain these shrubs in some way. But this particular shrub is really kind of a small tree. It's a big, big shrub. Um, and so when I did not prune it, like prune it up for a multi-stemmed or multi-trunked tree kind of thing. Um, and it's not tall, it's a little bit taller than me now. This one was planted in 2015, but I started trimming it up because it was taking over like this huge, like eight foot around space all over the ground. And I thought, well, that's not gonna work. I don't like that. Um, but then I started clipping, clipping up from the bottom and really giving a light shaping uh, in, the, in the spring. And that really made it beautiful. It's quite the, the uh, standout in this garden space now. So thinking about these native shrubs, don't be afraid to clip. Don't be afraid to maintain it like you would any other shrub in a garden. Um, little blue stem is the last one on this slide and it's very, very pretty. I do have a little bit of trouble keeping it in the garden for more than a few years in this pretty form. Um, it tends to kind of get too wet and dry, you know, die out in the center. It likes these drier environments um, where it can get some, uh, uh, a lot of drainage. So just think about that because that can be a problem. But they're beautiful when they're, when they're young. So planting new ones every so often isn't really a problem for me because I grow them. Amsonia elestris, um, this is... Uh, I would say, I don't know that it's a Kansas native. We do have a native that is Southeast Kansas though. Um, I think it's very, very similar to this. And I have one plant of that, but it's not as mature. This is kind of an immature photo of this plant. Um, it gets huge. Um, it can be really, really tall, this big and makes, but it keeps this beautiful vase shape. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous uh, perennial. Um, dies back to the ground and in April it's just sticking out of the ground like that but by May when it blooms it's a good three and a half feet tall and um, then we let it bloom kind of very it's gorgeous it looks just like that only big and, um, and we clip it off we cut it back after it blooms it'll do a second bloom and after that second bloom starts to fade there'll be seed pods on this first bloom level we cut it back to there and then it bushes out again. And within two weeks, it looks exactly like this, only all green. It's a beautiful shrub. Um, the reason we cut it back, two things, it makes a more compact form. And then the second thing is that it seeds itself aggressively. So when things do that and they're this big, it starts to be a problem in my garden um, for my design. Um, favorite all around grass, for gardens is this prairie drop seed, Sporobolus heterolepis. I would, any, any garden grass, any garden could, could utilize this grass really, really well. For a warm season grass, it comes out really early in May. I think this was a May or um, late May, early June picture. 
uh, of this grass and it's super pretty by then. Even before that though, it's like a little uh, kind of porcupine thing, it's, it's pretty. So I wouldn't hesitate to recommend that and um, really nothing to be concerned about uh, when you incorporate that grass. Um, these two down at the bottom um, left here are two that I like to use in gardens because the Hookera Richardsonii is the one in the back. You can kind of see it's got a, a flopped over leaf there. But that one is um, just like I'd said before, a good textural plant in the garden and it stays in a nice clump. You don't have to worry about it spreading or anything. And it stays, once you cut those seed heads off, it stays really short. It's not going to take up a lot of space. It's not going to get tall. It's not going to cause you any problems whatsoever. And then this Monarda bradburiana is my favorite of the bee balms for gardens. Um, it blooms early, uh, not in, so, so Monarda fistulosa, the one that we see in the prairie is, you know, it's going to bloom eye height to me and it's not blooming yet. It's going to bloom pretty soon, you know, uh, but this one blooms in May um, and stays short. It's only maybe 18 inches to two feet tall. Uh, and it doesn't lose its leaves like the Monarda fistulosa does. Um, it might get a little bit of downy mildew on it, but those leaves will stay most of the season. They turn kind of a, a purpley color. It's really pretty. Um, and then asters for late season color. I would say this is my favorite aster. It's called aromatic aster. It kind of makes a huge mound. It can be tripped, trimmed around the edges, kind of like a shrub, but it doesn't really need to. Um, really pretty in the spring too, when the new foliage comes out doesn't get tall like the rest of the, you know, like um, New England aster, which is a real tall one that I clip back. Don't have to do that with this one. It stays in a nice shrub form. Um, where to find plants? Uh, botanical belonging, we still sell plants, even though we're a nonprofit, we use those funds to um, support our educational mission. You know, having people here, they help me grow the plants. Uh, um, we support as many people as we can uh, with native plants and um, think it's a good thing to provide as big a variety so people can try these interesting species. We're open Saturdays from 10 to 4, um, except during the heat of the summer, which is coming on us really soon. And then I'm just open by appointment when, you know, I, I don't want to be out gardening and I don't think it's a good idea to plant too many plants then unless you're out there every day like me. Um, but so I'm open by appointment in the summer. Um, and then I open again in the fall. Uh, we have native plant sales, which a lot of, you know, you guys uh, probably have one too. <laughs> um, native plant sales, spring and fall. And those are the best times of course, to plant, um, and then grow native. The Missouri Prairie Foundation has a grow native program, and I'm a professional member of that, uh, program but they have a list of vendors that includes us here um, and people all over the region. So, um, you know, check, check those out when you're looking for plants. And these are some of the research tools that I would say, or the identification tools for plants, like identifying and start shopping for plants. I would look at some of these things like me, you could come here and talk to me all day if you want um, at Botanical Belonging. And then I use photos a lot. Everywhere I go, I take photos and then I've learned how I can put a little note on there to, to let me know, you know, what I was thinking, you know, when I saw that plant. Um, and then I go back and I'll evaluate that and compare it to online resources. I also use iNaturalist, which I didn't put on here, but I would caution people with iNaturalist or some of those, you know, plant apps for identification that sometimes those are suggestions and, and they're not often correct. So then using handbooks like um, the Kansas Wildflowers and Weeds or the big book, this one is my absolute favorite. That one, it's gigantic. You can't carry that in the field. Um, it weighs like five pounds, but you the, using those books, you know, to kind of evaluate what you what you see on those apps is really good. Um, there are lots of these three books that I've mentioned here are all I think authored by 
um, Craig Freeman and uh, Mike Haddock. Those two uh, really do a very good job with, with giving Kansas a lot of good uh, reference material. And I mentioned range maps before. Those are really good to check when you're using like those online uh, plant ID things or those apps, um, because those will kind of give you a heads up. Wait a minute, that might not be right. That doesn't occur here. Um, and then these are some other online resources at the bottom that I use. Missouri Botanical Gardens site, it does a really neat thing in their plant finder. It has a little speaker um, by the scientific name. And if you click it, somebody, don't know who it is, is nice enough to tell you how to say that Latin name, at least the way they think you should say it. So um, I talked to Craig Freeman at the herbarium and a lot of times he's like, well, you say it like, like, like you're from Europe or something. And it's too funny because there's really nobody that knows. Um, although I, I use, I, I figure Craig knows. He, he writes books about it and um, uh, knows about every species of penstemon there is. He's the expert. So those kinds of things down here will give you a lot of reference that you can use for these species um, and how to identify them, how to use them in gardens. Um, if you're just, just uh, interested in the gardening aspect of it, um, there's a book by, uh, oh, what is his name? It's Native Plants for Gardens. Um, and he used to be at the, uh, at Powell Gardens. And, it's a wonderful book, but it does include a lot of cultivars in there, which cultivars I try to avoid. I have a couple here in my garden, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm kind of trying to avoid that at all. I don't sell cultivars uh, here, but um, that one is uh, Alan Branhagen. That's his name. Alan Branhagen's book is a pretty good one. It gives you a lot of uh, species to look at. Oh, I have a dog in my room too. <laughs> and that is all I have for you today. Um, so thank you so much for letting me talk your ear off like I always do um, about native plants. And I hope uh, I shared some information that you can find useful. So if anybody has any questions, um, we can go from there. I'll stop sharing. Yeah, thanks so much, Patty. And um, we had a couple uh, questions from the chat, which I'll just read off uh, for you. And we had a question from uh, Ali Dishinger on um, uh, cutting back ironweed in spring. And also a question from Emily Lyson on is Monarda fishing is the most common, common Monarda. And just actually a quick side note for anyone in chat who's still around, um, like uh, I have just posted a, a long message that basically has all of the contact info for uh, for Patty and Botanical Belonging, as well as for any any non-master gardeners joining us on chat. Um, I'm the uh, horticulture and ag assistant for the extension office here in Douglas County. And uh, I've included my contact info as well as the excellent um, hot, uh, horticulture hotline contact info, which people should also to contact contacts for any native plant questions. And uh, me and Patty can, of course, also take your native plant questions and restoration ecology related questions. And yeah, so the two questions were, is Monarda the pitch list the most common one of the Monardas? And should we cut back iron weed, iron weed in spring? So, uh I think, you know, if you if you have an iron weed somewhere where you want it short, I would cut it back. Um, that will delay the bloom time. So where it gets hayed in our pasture, it'll bloom like in, I don't know, October, November even. Um, but in, you know, in the garden, it'll bloom a lot earlier if I don't cut it back. So where it's tall um, and happens to be, you know, up front some, I might cut it down. A lot of times I just pull them out. Uh, and then I'll stick them in a ditch somewhere because I think they're super pretty. But um, I would say, yeah, cutting cutting a lot of these things back. Now I wouldn't say that's something I would do to a blazing star. Like there are some things that that will rebloom if you cut them. But blazing stars, I think, would be an exception there. 
Um, and there was another one you said, I know Monarda fistulosa was a question. That's the most yeah. common one. Um, wild bergamot, it's, it's uh, a common name. That's the most common one that I see, you know, growing wild for sure. Um, but a lot of people ask me about scarlet bee balm, which is Monarda didyma or something like that. I don't carry that one. I don't see that one here. It's got an east, I think it's an eastern US native. Um, there are a lot of cultivars of that uh, out there. And um, I do have that in the garden, a cultivar that's pretty tall. Um, and then there's one that's kind of raspberry colored purple. So I'm not sure where those come from. Are, or you know, you know how how native they are. I'm sure that bees and other things will use them anyway, um, but I don't sell them here because I don't consider them really native. That's just me, though. Right. What other questions? And before we get some more questions in the chat, I'm going to just switch over to the audience on uh, here at the. Uh, uh, here in Dreher Hall here to just see if any audience members have any initial questions. Do you have your, your plants labeled in your garden? And if so, in what order? Common name first or botanical name first? Do you have plants uh, labeled in the garden and in what, and is common or scientific name uh, labeled first? So I, uh, so at the pollinator prairie, we ask this question a lot. And the only labels I'll have in my garden here are usually the ones that are telling me I put a plant there because it's new and I don't want to step on it or something like that. Um, what I label are the plants for sale. And then what I tend to do is when people come, I try to walk with them and talk in the garden with them. Um, it gets, you know, on some days, like on Saturdays, it can get really busy and there's not enough of me to go around, but I try, I love, I love talking with people in the garden and just standing next to a plant, you know, when it's mature or even when it's just coming out of the ground, when people are like, well, why, why don't I see that plant now? And I'm like, well, cause it's only like this tall right now. And you know, you milkweeds are like that. A lot of people are wondering, you know, why, why their milkweed isn't up yet um, when they just, they just aren't out of the ground yet. So no, as far as in the garden, but at the pollinator prairie, we're considering, cause you know, these gardens can get super tall and they get kind of filled in. So we, you know, so it's not like your typical, here's a plant, here's some mulch, you know, here's a plant, here's some mulch. You don't really have any space to put these things. And when they grow up, all of those, you know, lower signs disappear. So we will do, um, we're thinking about doing like a tall stake you know, with a garden, with a, with a sign on it and, and putting those out during the season, you know, as things get tall, we can kind of stake something close to, um, say the, the, we have a white wild, two white wild indigos that are huge. I mean, they're just gigantic. Um, and you know, there'd be no way to really put a stake under those, um, because there's all these other plants growing underneath. So we could put one next to it um, with that name on it so people could identify it. It's, it's kind of tough in some of these gardens to label things, but you can point them out you know, when you're walking in, around in these gardens so people can identify them at different stages. Does that help? If you can remember the name. The, the name. If yeah, you, yes, yes, it's helpful if you can remember the names. Yeah, yeah. so I think, yeah, I think that's yeah. the, that's kind of the, kind of gist of the botanical belonging thing. It's just that repetition of, of seeing, seeing these plants over and over. Um, like me, I know these plants, I know my garden, and, and most gardeners know their garden. Um, and over the years with this garden, it becomes a conversation. It's part of my home. I know where my things are, where my plants are. Um, and so that, that helps me a lot, even when I go someplace where I don't know the plants out in the, you know, out in the wild somewhere, you know, I can walk around and go, oh, there's a Baptisia. I, I recognize that because I've seen it in my garden. So those are, it's kind of a backwards way, you know, of learning it, but it's pretty awesome. It's super fun just to know them when you see them. And uh, I think we'll take one more question from the audience before we switch over to the other, uh, back to the chat. 
Um, do we have any other questions? And I'm, I'm also interested in hearing um, if the if anyone from the key horticulture team has any like kind of thoughts on things they see when they're uh, planning with native plants on campus and stuff like that. <laughs> if, 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 if anyone feels comfortable, if not, that's fine. <laughs> We have a big, we have a prairie acre that was started um, several years ago, probably. I don't know how long, but it's been, it has not been maintained because some of the groups that started it are defunct. Do um, you have any good advice on removing um, some of the invasive species, too much ragweed, et cetera, in one of those places? Perhaps. I think, I think that's a, that's a great question because I, my front yard, we converted it to kind of a, a prairie reconstruction kind of thing, even though this was never plowed either. It was just overseeded with, you know, lawn grasses and, and mowed for decades. Um, but the, the thing that I, I think about like ragweed, because the giant, I'm assuming it's giant ragweed or you might, yes. yeah, is that, you know, it's an annual. So if we if we just keep that cut back for a couple of years, you know, you're maintaining, I go, I mean, literally, we went through with, I have a scythe, you know, I go through and and just clippers. We walk through and we um we maintain it that way. We look at uh those species, we're not gonna dig them out, we're not gonna cover it because there are other things growing around it that we like. Um, and really, we just don't want it to seed itself and keep perpetuating that bare space that it creates underneath um, because it shades everything. So we, we really have a very loose management of things like that. Now, I did find out last year or the year before that um, I, I learned what quack grass looks like. Quack grass is in my prairie and it really drives me insane. And I don't really know how to control that. I think once, once uh, it's not in my prairie prairie, but it's in my reconstruction out here because it was all over this yard. Didn't know that, uh, hadn't identified that particular one. So identification of, of those kinds of species is, is really, really important. So if I can keep that from going to seed or figure out a way just to minimize its presence as much as possible i will i'm i'm will be hard pressed to ever get rid of it i'm sure and bind weeds the same way yeah. so yeah i'm not sure what um species you're dealing with but but the the ragweed i would say is is a minor minor issue just would require some some hot work out there with something to cut it down before it goes to seed yeah, yeah. i mean we certainly also have issues with other with the grasses that grow via rhizomes like the Bermuda grass and some Johnson grass is not in there, but yeah, I mean those rhizomatic grasses are really hard to get rid of. I, I agree, they really are. So we brought Johnson grass in here with some um, topsoil that we used. It's really, I mean, being able to identify things like that is even when you bring them in, like I saw those rhizomes, I had no idea what they were. And then when I finally did identify it, I was like, oh my gosh, luckily it was a, it was a small infestation and I was managed, I managed to get rid of it, which is kind of amazing. Cause it's, it's a, it's a, it's a monster. Yeah. yeah. Something I'll also, uh, I'll also just personally note about the prey acre because I'm familiar with that area. I grew up around it a lot. It is actually a heavily degraded, to my knowledge, the only heavily degraded prairie remnants actually on KU campus. So it actually uh, was a heavily degraded pasture that was former prairie. So it, and it, it's not necessarily like a restoration. It's a very heavily degraded remnant that has was, had an attempt to restore it about 10 years ago. Um, and to improve it a bit, Kelly Kinch and other people um, on campus have been like really behind that over the years. And then basically funding was lost because of uh, choices from our legislature. And so um, basically because of that, uh, we're looking to, there's other, looking for other sources for like maintenance of that, but it's a great area. I highly recommend people in chat checking that area out if they can. Um, and um, and uh, yeah, so, and for just a few other questions we have here. So we had some questions on 
How tall does Rose Verbena spread from Patty Wynn? And uh, Allison was saying it's uh, low ground cover, rarely over six inches. And then the second question was, which milkweed, this is from Therese Lawrence, which milkweed do you like best for interesting flowers or good behavior in the garden? <laughs> well, good I don't behavior. know. Yeah, I don't know. I I think I think uh, I think that butterfly milkweed, you know, good behavior is probably that's the best, you know, that people can think about. Um, that there's nothing wrong at all with that plant. Um, it doesn't doesn't spread like by rhizomes ish stuff like the 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 common. It stays in a nice clump, beautiful flowers. I mean, there's not much to complain about there. Um, but interesting wise, I would say, you know, using things like these, but they're not well behaved. So you've got all these things um, that you have to kind of consider. But I, I really do love the, the big milkweeds. I think they're beautiful. They, they're fragrant. Um, Sullivan's milkweed uh, has an upward facing flower with uh, beautiful color combinations in it. Um, gorgeous, but that and common milkweed, so Asclepias sullivantii, and, and those are, that's Sullivan's, and then Asclepias syriaca, that's common. They, very, very similar kind of habits where they, they spread by thick rhizomes underground and come up, you know, different places. So, you know, just knowing that's what happens, um, my method of, of controlling those things is really just controlling the edges and planting them way, way back. Uh, I'm gonna let them have a big space and I'm gonna put them way back there somewhere um, because they're awesome. They're beautiful plants to incorporate and they'll attract a lot of activity to your garden as far as the insect uh, uh, interactions, lots to talk with people about. So Sullivan's is kind of a prettier form in my mind to um, the common milkweed. Common milkweed, though, is what you see everywhere. It's very, very fragrant. Um, another one to think about, which is interesting, um, is a shorter kind of spreading form of a milkweed, which is the world milkweed or Asclepias verticillata or verticillata. I don't know how you say it, but that one is, um, uh, it stays pretty short. It can be pretty inconspicuous, so it doesn't kind of hit your beautiful flower, interesting flower thing, but monarchs love it. You find little caterpillars on it all the time, and I don't know why, because it's not very big, you know, and the not very much leaf, but they just love that. You always find the caterpillars on it, and they, and they go to it to lay their eggs, so um, that's one that you can let spread around in your garden and just give some space to milkweeds um, that isn't going to really take anything over. Um, and let's see what else I, I, the, the, the spider milkweed is pretty awesome. Um, purple milkweed, if you can find it is nice, uh, nice for a shadier area. Uh, it doesn't seem to spread a lot, but it's kind of picky. Um, so it doesn't like to grow very aggressively. So those are be my, my comments on milkweed. Best one is definitely butterfly milkweed for gardens. And uh, before we finish up here, do we have uh, one last question? Do you have any experience growing showy milkweed? Yeah. You know, I, I grew some from seed a couple years ago and uh, planted it in a couple places that all died. Um, but I planted one last year because I took the old seed and tried it again and planted one and it's coming up. So I don't, that's my only experience with it. So I don't know, does anybody know whether it spreads? Daniel, do you know? Um, well, I know this is for, for folks not familiar, this is the a milkweed with typical often like kind of white, pinkish white flowers. And it's like hoods, instead of like being like this, the flower, they're like that. They're exactly. like these, these yeah. like pointy things, kind of like that basically. Um, it's going to be kind of like on its own in my experience, kind of like, uh, if you ever heard of green milkweed with, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's going to, uh, kind of do its own thing in its own, like little niche, um, uh, because it's uh, less, more of a specialist, uh, not as much as say, um, my, my favorite milkweed, which I is the toughest one to ever grow, which is Mead's milkweed, but ah. um, it's a specialist. I saw Mead's milkweed last weekend with the Kansas native plant society. I it was yeah, no, 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 we were down no. in uh, Miami County. Oh my gosh, 
Oh. Yeah. If you guys want to just geek out about native plants, go yeah. on the Kansas Native Plant Society yeah. walk. It's pretty awesome. It's a, it's a threatened species and it's and it definitely needs a lot of help um, because a lot of people are destroying its remaining habitat. So it's uh, something to, along with Western French prairie orchid, if you guys ever look that up, um, or any of our prairie orchids that uh, need a lot of help in terms of reconnecting different habitats up to help those uh, folks out. Uh, great question. Um, I have another quick question. Yes, though you applied to well Hertella, and were you ever successful? Hertella or Hertella? Yeah, I. Uh, <laughs> I no, you know it. It came up in my garden. It it did come up from from a previous planting, and it flowered one year, and then I haven't seen it yet this year. So I think. I think it's not it's not going to persist where I've got it in the garden. I'm hoping it it really loves my prairie. It I mean it's just everywhere out there, and I just love it. It's gorgeous. But Hertella is a nice is is very, it's quite unusual, quite different, um, and would be awesome. But I find it like the spider milkweed, even though it easy to grow. I can get it to come up absolutely fine in a pot, but I can't transplant it very easily doesn't doesn't want to transplant at all. Um, so maybe establishing from seed somewhere, uh, if you can just kind of, you know, guard a little area where you're trying to get some seeds to go. And last year, the plants in my prairie did not produce any seed. Um, so I had I had a hard year with seed last year, didn't get a lot of seed from some of the normal things that I can usually collect from. Uh, yeah well, we'll get get your techniques well we are a, a little um over time although the conversation i'm sure over here um uh in the drear building in lawrence will continue but i but thank you so so much to uh patty for this amazing presentation i've enjoyed it tremendously thanks so much for uh for inviting me anytime and come see me because I, I love to talk yeah. plants all the time yeah this presentation is going to be posted on the um, YouTube page for the Master Gardeners. I don't think I posted a link for non-Master Gardeners in the chat, but if you just search the Douglas County Master Gardeners uh, webpage on YouTube, you will find it. And, um, and and I believe the chat is with all the information that I was posting on that chat should be there as well. But Thank you so much, Patty, and uh, looking forward to uh, Master Gardeners and everybody maybe doing more collaboration with you in the future. Awesome. I'll leave the meeting now, and thanks again, everyone. It was great talking with you. All right. Take care.